Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this report from the American College of Physicians on the state of the nation's health care. I'm Molly Cook, president of ACP, and I'm honored to be here today representing 137,000 internal medicine physicians and medical student members. ACP members are specialist physicians uniquely trained to apply scientific knowledge to the care of adults across the spectrum from wellness to complex illness. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Kaiser Family Foundation for allowing us to use their facilities here in Washington, D.C. for today's briefing. I'm a practicing physician and a professor of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco, and I am pleased to share ACP's recommendations for our nation's health care, improving the Medicare payment system and reducing barriers to health care, especially for our poorest residents. 2014 is a landmark year for American health care. For the first time ever, we can report that the United States is making historic gains in expanding health care coverage and reforming physician payments. Let's start with insurance coverage. Because of the Affordable Care Act, for the first time, no one will have to worry that they are on their own for their health care. The ACA assures Americans that their health insurance cannot be denied, taken away, or overcharged because they have a pre-existing condition. Because of the ACA, no American has to worry that their benefits in a given year or over a lifetime will be capped, putting them at risk of bankruptcy. Because of the ACA, being a woman is no longer considered a pre-existing condition. Because of the ACA, every American including seniors on Medicare, will have guaranteed access to life-saving preventive services at no cost to them. As with any major change, challenges will arise as health reform is fully implemented. As we face these challenges, we must not turn away from the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity the Affordable Care Act has created to address our health system's failings. We must confront them together and work constructively to analyze and solve them. Two health reform related challenges merit particular attention. One is the growing number of health plans that limit patient choice of doctors and hospitals through narrow networks. Of course, the trend to narrower networks antedates the ACA and is being seen in Medicare Advantage and large private health insurance plans. In addition, many plans are imposing highly restrictive pharmacy formularies that make it difficult for patients to get the medicines that work best for them. ACP believes that the federal government has a special responsibility to ensure that federally qualified health plans, whether offered through the exchanges created by the ACA or through Medicare Advantage, do not create unreasonable barriers to patients getting the medicines they need and appropriate care from physicians they know and trust. To address these barriers, ACP today sent a letter to HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, America's Health Insurance Plans, and the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association of America, proposing important improvements focused on our concerns about the impact of narrow networks and restrictive drug formularies, and other plan features that affect or could affect patient choice, access, and continuity of care. We call for a balanced, constructive, and transparent approach allowing patients to make informed decisions, promoting continuity of care, and ensuring fairness and due process for clinicians and patients, including strengthened federal and state regulatory oversight of qualified health plans. A second critical coverage issue concerns some of the poorest Americans. These individuals and families were expected to benefit from the ACA, but are being left out in 2014 because the states they live in have declined to accept federal do dollars to expand Medicaid to everyone with an income up to 133% of the federal poverty level. This is not a failing of the ACA, but of those states that have turned their backs on their poorest residents. Today, we renew our call on all states to do the right thing for their poorest residents by accepting federal dollars to expand the program to all persons with incomes up to 133% of the federal poverty level. 
Almost as important, a key program to improve Medicaid enrollees' access to primary care physicians and medical specialists, called the Medicaid Pay Parity Program, is set to expire at the end of 2014. Strong primary care improves quality and lowers cost. People with complex chronic illnesses need access to a complete range of subspecialty physicians. The Medicaid Pay Parity Program should be reauthorized by Congress and extended. Now, let's turn our attention to the progress being made in reforming payments within, the Medicare, within Medicare. For the first time since Congress enacted the deeply flawed Medicare Sustainable Growth Rate Formula in 1997, and some 12 years since the SGR triggered the first scheduled cut in physician payments, Congress is on the verge of passing bipartisan, bicameral legislation to repeal the SGR and accelerate the transition to value-based payment and delivery models. The House and Senate Committees of Jurisdiction have put forward legislation to repeal the sustainable growth rate. The cost to our federal budget of SGR repeal continues to drop. ACP and other physician membership organizations have provided extensive input into the bills and are energetically working to prepare our members for change. Today, we urge the House and Senate leadership to take immediate action to push comprehensive Medicare physician payment reform across the finish line before the next scheduled SGR cuts occur on April 1st. Let's build upon the enormous progress that has already been made so that 2014 truly is viewed as a watershed year in which we can honestly say that the state of the nation's health care is good and getting better, that millions of Americans formerly without insurance are moving into the ranks of the insured, and that we are making serious progress on paying for value for uh, patients within the Medicare system. Now, Bob Doherty, ACP's Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs and Public Policy, will tell you more about today's report and our recommendations. After Bob's comments, we'll both be open to Q&A. Bob? Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Dr. Cook. I am Bob Doherty, ACP's Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs and Public Policy. I have overall staff management responsibilities for ACP's Public Policy Office here in D.C. As Dr. Cook noted, 2014 marks the beginning of an historic journey toward the destination of providing affordable health care coverage to nearly all Americans. Because of the ACA, millions of us who in the past were left behind are now getting covered. They are our neighbors, our family members, our coworkers. Because of the ACA, millions of us can now get coverage from insur health insurance marketplaces, giving us a choice of qualified health plans that must cover essential services, including no-cost preventive services. Because of the ACP, million, ACA, millions of us will get help in affording coverage through the sliding scale premium subsidies of, 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 that are applied to qualified health plans. Because of the Affordable Care Act, millions of young adults, including my own 24-year-old son, are covered by their parents' plans. Because of the ACA, millions of our poorest residents can now enroll in Medicaid, at least in the states that have agreed to expand the program. And because of the ACA, my own 84-year-old mom and tens of millions of seniors like her now have Medicare coverage for no-cost preventive services and better coverage of prescription drugs under Medicare Part D. Our state of the nation's health care report breaks down by the numbers, how many people will benefit from the ACA and in what ways. The journey to expanding coverage will take years to com complete. Like any journey, especially one that takes us into entirely new territories, there will be bumps and detours along the way. And let's admit it, too many people had trouble even getting started on the journey because of the repairs needed to the federal enrollment portal, www.healthcare.gov. Yet improvements are being made, and the path to coverage is getting smoother. We know also that there are huge variations in how willing the states have been to help their residents navigate the journey to ACA guaranteed coverage. In some states, enrollment is off to a very fast pace. In others, it's all backed up, like my drive to work this morning. But like any journey we're taking, we can't turn back because we run into heavy traffic because we get a flat tire or hit a pothole or miss a turnoff. We have to keep on going until we arrive at our destination. We have to keep on going even though we know more improvements are needed. We have to keep on going even though the political opponents of the ACA keep putting up roadblocks in our way. The American College of Physicians is committed to doing everything we can to help the United States arrive at the destination of affordable health insurance coverage for all. 
As we find barriers along the way that make the journey more difficult, we must speak out about them and propose ways to overcome them. We are concerned that the promise of providing all Americans with access is undermined when health plans impose excessive restrictions on patients' ability to continue to see the physicians they trust or receive the medications they need. We believe that the federal government, the insurance industry, and state regulators have a responsibility to address such barriers, not only in the qualified plans offered through the ACA, but also in the Medicare Advantage program. Now, the college is pleased that on February 4th, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released an important letter to insurers in the federally administered marketplaces that would strengthen network adequacy requirements, increase the supply of essential community providers, provide greater transparency and scrutiny of prescription drug formularies. The letter sent this morning to HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and America's Health Insurance Plan, the college calls on uh, CMS, state regulators and insurers to take additional steps in addition to those just announced by the agency. We need to improve the current network adequacy standards by taking into account additional criteria, including patient and physician ratios, use of added network clinicians and hospitals, and urban, suburban, and rural area relevant standards that are tailored to those areas and are important indicators of access. We need to continuously monitor network adequacy. We are encouraged that CMS will be monitoring adequacy via complaint tracking and random spot checks. We recommend that such compliance and complaint information be made available to the public. We need to strengthen requirements for the inclusion of essential community providers, such as federally qualified health centers, Ryan White HIV AIDS providers, and safety net hospitals. We need to mandate that qualified health plans provide physicians and their patients with advance notice and network changes and the opportunity to appeal. We need to ensure that physicians have the option of applying to any health care plan or network in which they desire to participate and have their application judged based on objective criteria that are available and that are transparent to both applicants and enrollees. We should require transparency in the criteria used by qualified health plans to determine who will be allowed into their networks. We should prohibit qualified health plans from excluding healthcare clinicians because their practices contain substantial numbers of patients with expensive medical conditions. We should require qualified health plans to provide up-to-date network directories in real time when a potential enrollee is choosing a plan rather than after the fact, including making prompt updates upon receipt of new information relating to network participation. We should create an open enrollment period to allow patients to choose another qualified health plan in addition to the regular enrollment period if an outdated network directory, has in directory is incorrectly listed and enrollees preferred physician is being part of the network. We should require qualified health plans to establish health care provider hotlines, connect physicians, hospitals, and other providers to plan representatives to answer questions, verify patient information, and obtain other information. We should create an appeals process to authorize in-network cost sharing if a medically necessary service is not available within the network but is it available from an out-of-network physician who is willing to accept the terms of service. This exception is permitted for preventive services, but it should be expanded and include other essential health benefits. Qualified health plans with restrictive formulas should allow patients to continue to receive disputed medications during an entire exception review process, and if an exception is granted, continue to provide coverage for that drug for subsequent plan years. There must be a mechanism for expedited internal and external review and appeals in urgent health care situations. And we need to closely monitor formularies and other benefit design features to ensure that coverage does not exclude patients with complex chronic conditions, including patients with cancer, transplants, mental health treatment, HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C. Such limited formularies and plan restrictions would violate the spirit of the ACA's non-discrimination provisions, which would prohibit discrimination based on factors including health status, disability, age, race, gender, and sexual orientation. Our report and the letters accompanying it provide a fuller explanation of these and other ideas for addressing the barriers to care created by excessively narrow networks and drug formularies. Now, to be clear, the college is not, not advocating the health plans must provide unfettered access to every physician, hospital, and medication. We recognize that some physicians and hospitals have higher and possibly unjustifiably higher utilization rates, poor outcomes, and higher admission and readmission rates. We do not advocate that every medication be on a plan's formulary when there's an equally effective and less exp exp expensive alternative. Rather, we offer constructive and balanced safeguards that emphasize consideration of additional standards in addressing network adequacy, transparency in network selection criteria, and for physician performance measures. We also should ensure that consumers have access to real-time network directories 
improvements in the health plan shopping experience, and exceptions to ensure continuity of care. Now I'll turn my attention to another barrier to access, the continued unwillingness of some states to extend access to, 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 for Medicare to Medicaid to the poor and near poor. As a result, five, some 5 million low-income people who are supposed to get coverage under the Affordable Care Act will be left behind in 2014 just because they live in a state that is not expanding Medicaid. Now, the encouraging news is that a majority of states have expanded Medicaid or expressing intent to do so, the Republican governor of Utah being one of the most recent. Leaving Utah's poorest residents without health insurance, quote, is not fair and it's not right, end quote, Governor Herbert said in a State of the State appro uh, speech to Utah lawmakers last month. Quote, assisting the poor in our state is a moral obligation that must be addressed. He is right. And ACB is committed to doing everything it can to encourage remaining states to heed their moral obligation to cover their poorest residents. In October 2013, ACB urged all its chapters to encourage its states to expand Medicaid. Despite a very difficult political environment, our chapters came through for their patients. Armed with state-specific data, they told their states that expanding Medicaid is the right thing to do for the health of their populations, but also for the health of their state budgets. The college is now in the process of updating the information we provided to our chapters to help those in states that have not yet agreed to the expansion to again make the case that opening up Medicaid to the poor and near poor is the fiscally right thing to do for states, even though the federal contribution declines gradually over the next 10 years, at no point will be less than 90% of the cost. When other savings to the states are considered, most state budgets will end up better off than if they don't expand Medicaid. Now states that wait another year or more will be leaving federal dollars at the door. That makes no sense. Dollars that otherwise would go to the benefit of their residents and their treasuries. It is simply wrong to leave the poorest of the poor without coverage. Without access to Medicaid, people with incomes below the poverty level will have no access to coverage under the Affordable Care Act, while higher income residents will be, be able to get subsidies to buy coverage to the exchanges. That makes, not, not, makes no sense. It's not fair. It is wrong. Medicaid coverage is also associated with better self-reported health and preventive services, and people enrolled in Medicaid are less likely to report the costs of creating a barrier to getting needed care. We rec recommend that all states authorize expansion of Medicaid to persons with incomes up to 133% of the federal poverty level by no later than the end of this year. CMS should work with the states to consider options to grant waivers to states to expand Medicaid in a manner that best meets the state's need, provided that enrollees are not subjected to fewer benefits or higher cost sharing and eligibility requirements than are now required. We also recommend that Congress do its part to ensure that Medicaid enrollees will have access to a personal physician by re reauthorizing an important program to raise Medica Medicaid payment rates for primary care to no less than the apl applicable Medicare rates. Finally, let me turn my attention to Medicare physician payment reform. Last week, historic agreement was reached between the three congressional committees with jurisdiction over Medicare to permanently reform Medicare physician payments. We are pleased with the bill they've agreed to, the SGR Repeal and Medicare Provider Payment Modernization Act of 2014, includes key reforms advocated by ACP. Specifically, the bill removes the imminent threat of physician payment cuts and assures a 5% five-year period of annual update to 0.5% to help phys physicians to transition to new systems. It improves the existing fee-for-service system by rewarding value over volume. It consolidates three existing quality improvement programs into a new streamlined and improved program that rewards physicians who meet performance thresholds and improve care for seniors. It rewards physicians that engage in clinical practice improvement activities that will help facilitate their future participation in alternative payment models. It implements a process to improve payment accuracy. It creates incentives for care coordination for patients with chronic health care needs. It creates incentives for physicians to move into alternative payment models, including a 5% bonus payment to physicians who receive a significant portion of their revenue from patient-centered medical homes. It establishes a process to review and recommend physician-developed alternative payment models based on criteria developed through an open comment pro process. It expands the use of Medicare data for transparency and quality improvement. ACB will continue to work with members of Congress to get this bill to the President for his signature no later than March 31, 2014, to time to prevent a, near, a scheduled cut of nearly 24% on April 1. The college strongly opposes another temporary patch of freeze. Now that we have agreement reached on a bipartisan, bicameral bill to reform Medicare physician payments and repeal the SGR, there's absolutely no reason for Congress to put up acting now to send real reforms of the President's first signature. 
I am tired of lobbying Congress and the SGR, and I think they're tired of hearing from me and my fellow lobbyists. Let's get it done. To summarize, the recommendations presented today by the American College of Physicians are often in the spirit, making sure that even if we expand coverage, we build upon the positive steps being taken by the administration to address potential obstacles to patients accessing care from a physician they trust and medi getting the medications they need. They are offered in the spirit of building upon the progress being made by Congress to reform, reform Medicare physician payments, highlighting the policies that we believe are essential to real reform. Dr. Cook and I will now be pleased to answer your questions. Please type your questions in and we will read them from an iPad. Thank you. Okay, there's one question. Do you feel the changes you outlined today are the top priorities for improving the ACA? What would you expect your recommendations? Would, would they increase the willingness of the public to sign up for exchange plans? So the college has been uh, strongly in support of the uh, ACA since the uh, earliest days. And our recommendations today are designed to uh, help the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, realize the vision of uh, universal access to uh, health care, uh, a um, appropriate um, minimum benefits package, uh, and uh, high quality, high value uh, care for all Americans. The recommendations that we're making today um, address uh, some of the uh, issues that have raised concern as the uh, Affordable Care Act has been implemented. Uh, we just want to uh, make sure that we continue on the trajectory to achieving the vision uh, that is fundamental to the Affordable Care Act. And yes, uh, the, uh, the better the program uh, works, the easier it is uh, to use, the more attractive it will be to the American people. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think obviously the first priority is keep on moving down the road of coverage. Efforts to repeal the ACA, defund or set it back, we, we could reverse all the progress we, we are making, leaving millions without insurance coverage, affordable coverage. I think a second key priority is the Medicaid expansion. Every state that is not yet on board needs to take a really hard look at the numbers that will show it's in their financial interest to do so, but in the interest in their residents. And yes, we do need to address barriers to care created by narrow networks and formularies in a responsible way. And then, of course, reforming the Medicare physician payment system and getting it done. Okay, there's a question for Julie Miller. What accountability do physicians feel they have for controlling costs? Ah, wonderful question. And uh, speaking as a uh, clinician, uh, uh, clearly physicians uh, pl pay, play a key role here. It's been said that the most expensive uh, tool in the medical armamentarium is the physician's pen. Uh, and so, Absolutely, we have a role, and the college has been very actively engaged in uh, helping physicians uh, understand their responsibility, uh, starting with uh, programs for medical students and medical residents uh, out uh, to practicing clinicians. So absolutely, we have a role to play. The other big change is the Medicare SGR bill that we just talked about that's been agreed to by Republicans and Democrats alike. Imagine that, Republicans and Democrats agree on something. House and Senate, actually holds physicians accountable. Mm -hmm. An increasing portion of Medicare fee-for-service payments will be set aside each year, depending on how well physicians do and metrics of quality improvement, efficient use of resources, use of electronic health records, and other measures. Or, alternatively, physicians can go into an alternative payment model, like a patient set of medical home, which is a form of advanced primary care, where those models will also be measured in terms of their performance in improving quality and lowering costs. So that's really what the SGR is all about. It's not just really getting rid of the SGR, which of course is essential. It's to move towards systems of accountable payment. Okay, next question. Does the ACB have a position on how the SGR bill should be paid for, given that payment is going to be the most difficult aspect, aspect of getting the bill to the president's desk? Yeah. Well, we uh, appreciate that the cost of the permanent repeal uh, needs to be um, uh, recovered somewhere in the budget, we have made a set of uh, suggestions 
that are, are available um, on our website and have been uh, widely circulated. We don't, uh, as a sort of advocacy position, say, uh, you know, these are our, our top three recommendations. We've laid out a, a number of options. Uh, you know, Congress has been thinking about this uh, for a long time as well, and, and none of the uh, options for offsets are um, sort of new or unfamiliar. Yeah, and let me just add to that. I mean, it's not like there's going to be a lightning bolt of inspiration right. and Congress is going to figure out how to pay for this thing. They've been looking at this issue now for over a decade now. There are a menu of options in the Congressional Budget Office, uh, Bipartisan Policy Center, a lot of folks have put forward. We've given some ideas that they can choose from. Yeah, yeah. It's really a matter of political will. And the idea that if we punt again and post postpone this for the six months or nine months a year that's going to get any easier politically is nonsense. Mm -hmm. At some point, it's hard decisions got to be made. Better make them now. The other thing is if they punt and wait and do another patch, the cost is actually going to go up because you have to pay for the patch, and then you also have to pay for the long-term reform anyway. Right. The long-term reform doesn't go away. Right. You just postpone it. And then the, the other thing to keep in mind is, again, what we're moving towards is value-based payment, which in itself will reward efficient, effective medical care. Okay, uh, another question. In your paper, you are pushing states to accept Medicaid expansion, stating they have a moral obligation to care for their poorest residents. Are you making a similar push to physicians to participate in Medicaid? Uh, yes. Uh, the the uh, college has uh, a um, long-standing uh, uh, expectation and articulation that, that a fundamental feature of physicians' professional values is to meet the needs of people who are sick, uh, regardless of a whole variety of uh, individual circumstances, uh, including the patient's um, socioeconomic status. That being said, uh, I live in a state where uh, Medicaid uh, in California called Medi-Cal has uh, traditionally paid uh, 50 or 60 percent of what Medicare pays for the same service. And it's just a reality that physicians can't keep their practices afloat and be useful to any of their uh, patients uh, if they uh, are losing money hand over fist taking care of Medicaid patients. So uh, this underlines the importance of the Medicaid parity uh, provision that we have already uh, talked about. Yeah, and just to add to that, the Medicaid pay parity provision is critical. There are numerous studies over the years that show that physician participation in Medicaid is related to the payment rates. And it's a simple matter of math. Uh, Medicaid pays so low, or has paid so low in states like California, that it simply was not possible for physicians to accept larger than Medicaid patients in their practices. We know from these studies that if payment rates are made more competitive, participation rates go up. The problem is that this Medicaid pay parity program was in effect last year, although it was late in getting started, and it runs out at the end of December. So basically, primary care doctors and other medical specialists will take a pay cut on January 1 for taking care of Medicaid patients, this program is not reauthorized. So that's why we say it needs to be reauthorized and extended. It appears that was our last question, so thank you for joining us for this year's State of the Nation's Healthcare Report. You notice on the web page where you're watching that you can also find today's report, each of our prepared remarks, a summary of the paper, fact sheets on the paper, and the letters that were sent this morning to the insurance industry, state insurance regulators, and the federal government. For immediate follow-up in today's program, please contact David Kinsman at 202-441-3573, 202-441-3573, and thank you. Thank you.